Hey there, Dan Gastu here. Today's video is about welding a crack in an aluminium boat and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. We've done a bit of welding in previous videos, but I've never really gone through the finer points of aluminium welding. I'm certainly no expert at aluminium welding, but I have done some training in it. The course was a bit hit and miss, to be honest with you. But you do pick up a few things on the way. You figure out what works, what doesn't work, basically through sort of just experience through trying. So I'll share those things. When bare aluminium is left open to the atmosphere, it forms this really hard layer of oxide on the surface. And the thing about this oxide layer is as well as being quite hard, physically hard, it melts at around about 2000 degrees Celsius and, and the aluminium itself melts at about 650 degrees Celsius. So there's a pretty big difference. What this means is you've really got to get rid of this oxide layer. Now, there's no substitute for having a really clean piece of aluminium getting either a brand new stainless steel brush that doesn't have any contamination from having cleaned something else in it. So a good stainless steel brush, a brand new flap disc, something like that, just to get that oxide layer off. Now the welder itself helps you in this department too, and I'll show you what that's about. The welding technique I'm gonna be using today is TIG welding, which is tungsten inert gas. And the inert gas I'm using in this case is just pure argon. That argon is a shielding gas, so it comes through the center of the torch, I'll show you that in a second and envelops the hot weld in argon so that oxygen can't get to it and cause the weld to oxidize and all sorts of other nasty things happen. You'll know straight away if you've left the argon off because it all just goes black and nothing happens at all. Nothing good anyway. Now you've probably all heard of AC current and DC current, like DC being like a battery in your car and AC being in a household. So the welding we're going to be doing today is AC welding. So AC TIG welding is what this video specifically is about. So if we have a line which is zero volts, the welder makes a square wave and from positive to negative and it does this square wave like this. So what this means is that some of the time the electrode we're welding with is positive, sometimes it's negative, which means that sometimes the electrons are flowing from the work to the tungsten, sometimes from the tungsten to the work. Now for the period of time that the electrode is positive, the welding process is actually clearing away, blasting away that oxide layer. So you've got as much of it off as you can mechanically, i.e. with a brush or whatever, but that period of time, the welder itself will actually clear it off. Then, when it goes to the electrode negative time, that's when it's actually doing the welding and penetrating the metal. What modern welders let you do is change the ratio of positive to negative. You might decide you've got a thin bit of metal, so you don't really need to get in and, and have a, the weld penetrate deep but you do want to get that oxide layer off. So you can have more positive, a short amount of negative, then a longer positive like this. And vice versa, if you've got a large, thick piece of aluminium that's very clean, you might choose to have a lot more electrode negative relative to the positive. So this is one of the primary settings you might want to be aware of when you're setting your welder up to weld aluminium. All right, I'll show you the crack I'm going to be welding on my boat. So this is the crack here. It's right on the chine. It appears to be about five centimeters long. What I'm going to do now is get the wire wheel out and just brush this all as clean as I can. Then we'll give it a bit of an acetone wipe. Then I'm going to use a special developing die to see if we can find the true extent of this crack. Okay, clean stainless steel brush and we'll just give it a good scrub. The tungstens I'm using today are 2% lanthanated. Here we go. And 2.4 millimeter diameter. Now, when you get a tungsten out of the packet, they're blunt like this and they need to be sharpened. The idea is that you sharpen it so that the lines actually run forward along the tungsten towards the tip. Because of that, it's really important that you never put one in a drill like this and hold it against a stone wheel that's loaded up with all sorts of other contaminants. So when you finish sharpening your tungsten using any technique other than that, you'll end up with something like that. Now, one of the next steps they talk about often is balling a tungsten, which is getting it to go from this really fired point to having a small ball on the end. 
Personally, I find that it's impossible for that not to happen, so I've never really gone out of my way to make it happen. It's the electrode positive part of the cycle where the electrons are coming from the work up to the tungsten that makes that happen. And there's talk about just holding it above certain types of metal to make it happen. I find it just happens within the first few seconds of trying to do any aluminium welding anyway, so. The next step is to put your tungsten into a little collet like that. which then goes into the back of the torch. And there's a little back part here that locks it in. Now, what you also hear with TIG welding, sorry, this cup is actually the last one I've got and it's terrible, but they talk about tip out, which is how much you have your tungsten sticking out. The further out it is, the easier it is to see, but it ends up too far out from the shielding gas. Now, I usually go with something like this, but because this tungsten will ball up, it will actually shrink slightly. So I'm gonna start a little bit longer, and then we'll see where it ends up once the tip is balled. We can always adjust it afterwards, it's no big deal. What I'm gonna do now is take a relatively unprepared piece of aluminium, and without any filler rod, I'm just gonna run the tungsten along it, and I'll show you that section, you'll see a width of the metal where that cleaning action has started to clear the oxide layer that will be on here quite thickly. So I'll do that quickly, then I'll show you the result. I'm gonna clamp the ground straight to the aluminium itself, but you know, you can clamp it to the bench and have the aluminium on the metal bench. I've just put some gloves on, some leather gloves on because the work gets very hot. And although it doesn't give off a lot of splatter the way, say, stick welding does, Jig welding does give off a lot of UV, so if you don't have long sleeves on, you can get really badly sort of sunburned. All right, I'm gonna start by just hitting the button. All that happens when you hit the button is the current starts flowing. Now, I don't have a foot switch. I'll talk about that in a second, but all I have essentially is an on-off mode. What I'm gonna do first is just hold it a bit above the aluminium and we'll see how much the tip balls up. Then what I'll do is run it along and show you the effect that the cleaning action has. So this is what the tungsten looks like when it balls up a little bit. That really fine tip is gone. So I could actually bring that in a little bit, into the cup a little bit, so that it's a little bit closer to that argon shield. So you can see there, we've got relatively little stick out now. So this is the effect of running it along. And this area, this wide area you can see, is actually the cleaned area. The section that would melt is a much narrower area in the center here. What we'll do now is I'll have a go at strapping one of these old welding helmet lenses to the camera and I'll weld these two little aluminum tabs together and hopefully I can give you a bit of a close-up of what the process looks like. When you stick welding you drag your weld across but with TIG you actually push forward towards your weld. Then my filler rod, which is the metal I'm gonna melt into the weld, it almost forms a 90 degree between the torch and the filler rod. So I'm gonna move this way and every time I melt the puddle, I'm gonna dip a little bit of filler rod in. As soon as I dip it in, it'll melt straight away. And I'm gonna keep going and just melting it like this. The tungsten doesn't get consumed, but the filler rod does. So I need to sort of have this action with my hand where I keep feeding the filler rod along as it gets consumed. Firstly though, I'm just gonna give these a bit of a clean. I've cleaned the edges of these two tabs of aluminium, and hopefully you can also see there's a slight bevel on them, which helps me get in and get the weld to penetrate further towards the back of the metal. So hopefully you can see there the basic process of pushing the puddle along, dipping filler rod into it. It's good if you can, getting the coordination up, that as you dip, you don't pull the filler rod too far away. You'd like to ideally keep the tip of the filler rod inside that argon shield as well as the weld itself. Now, I'll show you a few problems in this weld and then talk to you about some of the solutions to that. 
So you can see here, the weld kind of starts out okay, but it's only a small amount of metal. It eventually gets saturated with heat, and this heat builds and builds and builds, and you can see the welds getting wider and wider, and then when you get close to the edge of a piece of metal, there's nowhere for the heat to go. And so very quickly, when you get towards the edge of a piece of metal, it can really just start to melt and disappear on you. This is where having a foot pedal to start with the higher amps, and then as you come along, if you see the welds starting to widen, you just back off the pedal a little bit, lower the amps, and you can compensate sort of dynamically as you go. In this case, I didn't do that because I don't have one of those pedals, but it gives you an idea what can happen as heat comes into the metal you're welding. The other thing is, this is lifted at this edge because I've just done a weld across here. So with aluminium, and any weld for that matter, you need to really just do a few tacks in places to hold the metal in place before you start doing your weld. You can even do a weld where you do a bit here, a bit here, come and fill the middle, all these sort of techniques to stop it just building heat, building heat, building heat, and distorting the metal. What I'm going to do this time is grab another two bits of metal and I'm going to tack it in various places first and then we're going to weld it. But we're sort of stitch weld, we'll jump sections. I might do the edges first because they're the most vulnerable to excess heat and then we'll do the middle section last and you'll see the difference. What I'm going to do first is do a tack at each end while the metal's still quite cool to hold the edges in place. Then I'm going to do two more tacks to divide it in thirds. Then I'm going to weld the outside third the other outside third, and then the inside third last. So one tack on the edge. The other end. It takes a little longer to get a puddle in the middle because the heat dissipates more readily. Alright, so now we've got four tacks. Edges, divide with thirds. I'm going to weld one third, the other third, the middle last. So you can see here, this is the second bit I divided into thirds. And you can see how much less distorted and displaced these plates are compared to the bit that I just did in one run. So having your mind on you know, heat management is really important with welding. Try to get one bit welded, let it cool, come somewhere else, tack it in all the places to prevent it moving, and then fill it in as you go. Now we've gone through the basics of TIG welding technique, let's go and fix the crack on the plate. I'm not super happy with how clean that wire wheel's got this, so I'm actually going to give it a really light run over with the flap disc now. This is a very old boat, uh, kind of 70s, so what does that make, you know, 40 something years old. So I'm going to be pretty light with it because I don't want to make what is worn thin aluminium any worse. Alright, this is what we're left with now, you can still see the crack along here. The die I'm going to be using today is a Sherwin brand. I don't know, I've never used it before. I'm going to give it a go. This is DR60, this cam, which is a bit of a cleaner. It says it's step two, but in the instructions it sort of says you can use it to clean the metal first. Then we're going to put on a penetrant. Then we can actually use this to clean excess penetrant off. So they actually call it step two, but it's kind of step one and three, really. Clear? We'll call that clean. Next step is to spray the penetrant on, which is DP50, and leave it for five minutes. All 
All right, now we've got to wait five minutes for that to dry, so we may as well just chill out and have a beer. I'm glad you brought that up, actually. What I don't get is why when you do it, it's cool. When I do it, I never hear the end of it. Huh? That's sexist. All right, let's see what it looks like now. Ugh. Looks like some sort of slasher horror film, but that's how it came out. All right, it says to wipe it with a clean cloth now and then clean it again afterwards with the cleaner we used originally. So it is more of a dye rather than a paint. It seems to come off relatively easily. Rather than spraying it directly with the cleaner, I think I'm gonna put the cleaner onto the rag and then wipe it. Now with the developer, which is D100, it says to do two or three light coats are preferred to a heavy coat. All right, I'll leave it at that. Let that dry for a little bit, do another one, let it dry, do another one, see what we see. All right, this is what it looks like after a few coats of the developer been on. And it looks like the crack doesn't go too much further, which is great. It's pretty much is limited to what we can sort of see visibly. So what I'm going to do now is drill two small holes, one at the end of each crack to stop it spreading even further, and then we'll weld it out. This drill bit's just a one or two millimeter drill bit, something like that. I'm just gonna punch a little mark to stop the drill bit wandering. What I'm gonna do now is clean it all up again. Even if that makes it a little bit harder to see the, the crack, I know I just have to weld from hole to hole now. Because this is much thinner metal, I'm gonna turn the amps way down compared to the little demo on the thick aluminium on the bench. And you're much better off kind of going, ah, it needs a bit more, add a bit more, than blowing a big hole through your boat that's hard to fix. So no harm in having it too cold initially, but just make sure you get good penetration on the weld before you're sort of satisfied and then continue to weld the whole crack out. Filler rods come quite long, so it's worth getting a little set of these mini bolt cutters just to halve them. Half a filler rod's a good amount of filler rod, but it doesn't sort of end up being too ungainly. One other thing I like to do is to hit the button on the torch a few times before I start welding, just to make sure I'm getting argon through the torch rather than maybe some air that's got into the line if I haven't used it for a while. I'll show you what it looks like. I'm a bit happier that it looks like it's penetrated a bit better than that test weld on the bench. And we're past the limit of the crack. The holes should have stopped it spreading. We've now welded into good metal either side of the holes. I think we'll call that job done. Well, thanks for watching. I hope this video helps you if you're looking to get into TIG welding aluminium and particularly welding cracks like this. I think eventually I'm going to rename this boat filler rod because it's had so many cracks over the years and one other thing probably worth mentioning about cracks is if they happen they generally happen for a reason in this case I believe a lot of the cracks along that shine happen because of what's an obvious accident this boat's had at some stage in its life but if the cracks occur due to the stresses of normal use of the boat then I would look into welding in some extra bracing to make that part stronger. It obviously wasn't up to the job originally and needs a little bit of extra sort of reinforcing. All right, well, thanks for watching. Take care and I'll catch you next week. See ya.